thank you so much. I, I totally just laughed at my own joke when he read that. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Well, so um, as Enrique said, my, my experience with early learning extends to uh, one seven-year-old, and she's one of the easy ones. So uh, when I got the email from Aaron asking me to speak today, I thought possibly it was a mistake. And um, it felt sort of like, uh, you know, I like to canoe on Lake Washington in the summer. And it was for, felt sort of like uh, I got an email from the Navy saying, hey, we heard about your canoeing experience. Would you, <laughs> Would you like to be a fleet admiral, maybe? <laughs> it's funny, I, I used to do stand-up comedy and jokes about the Navy always get laughs. I have no idea why this is. Uh, so um, I am a, uh, a food writer and um, I, uh, I've been doing that in, uh, in Seattle for uh, over 10 years now. And um, recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, I did get a new uh, job uh, writing about personal finance, and I write a weekly column on that, and investing in particular. And uh, to, to my daughter Iris's uh, shock and dismay, um, there is gonna be a small personal finance section uh, to my talk today. Um, she, she is not a big fan of my new job. Talking about food, she thinks lots of fun. Talking about uh, bonds, not so much. Um, so, I want to draw a parallel between, uh, between feeding kids on the one hand and personal finance on the other hand. These are, these are both things that I'm allegedly an expert at and know uh, one or two things about. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I write about investing and I realized partway into that that compared to most other pursuits in our lives, investing is really weird. And what I mean by this is, um, I, I thought back to, um, uh, like Sergeant Diaz's son, uh, I, I was a swimmer and uh, I was on the swim team in high school. And um, anyone else here done a competitive individual sport? Yeah. Then, then you know that, that doing a competitive individual, individual sport involves working really, really hard for a tiny amount of progress. And you slog and slog and slog. And I would go to, uh, to swim practice after dinner every night for over an hour. And I would go home and sleep like a rock for nine hours, which I wish I could still do. And, <laughs> um, and if you have a, a swim coach, a, uh, an advocate intervening on your behalf, uh, so much the better. Someone to stand over you with a stopwatch and say, and say, you know, you need to shave half a second off your 50 meter freestyle time. You need to improve your stroke right there. Uh, you know, just jumping into the pool and hoping for the best is not how Michael Phelps got to be Michael Phelps. And we've heard a lot about valuable early interventions today. And so what I want to talk about is kind of the value of knowing when not to make an intervention. So back to, back to investing for, for just a brief moment, I promise. I figured that when I started learning about investing, it would be kind of the same thing. That if, uh, if you want to make money investing, then you would have to be involved. That you would have to read up on what are the good companies to invest in and what are the bad companies, you know, like Warren Buffett does. Uh, that you would have to know when to get into the market and when to get out. Uh, and if you read Money Magazine or, uh, or watch Jim Cramer, that's kind of what it looks like, you know, very, uh, very active. And it turns out that this is completely and totally wrong. Uh, and we've known this for a long time. Um, probably the best study on the subject is by Odin and Barber from 2000. It was a study called uh, Trading is Hazardous to Your Wealth. And uh, they looked at a bunch of investors and found that the ones who traded stocks most often lost a lot more money than the ones who held onto their stocks forever. And it's even weirder than that. Other studies have found that investors who look at their portfolio more often underperform investors who look at their portfolio less often. So it's kind of like if the swim coach was coming in every six months to look at the team and he goes in there and he says, eh, looks all right, and then goes back to taking a nap. And the team is still winning. And so I thought, and, and by the way, this, this concludes the personal finance portion. <laughs> so, so then I thought, is there anything else in my life that works in this peculiar sort of way? And it turned out there was, and her name is Iris, and she's seven, and she was sitting at the dinner table. And of course, I don't mean this in all aspects of early learning, just, just one. So, so like I said, I'm a food writer. And the reason I'm a food writer is because I, uh, I love to eat, I love to cook, and I love to share it with people. And basically, everything that I write 
sounds kind of the same. It's all a var variation on, uh, hey, I went to this Thai place in the U District and they had this spicy fried rice dish and you've got to try it quick before they go out of business. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really good thing that food writing exists because if it didn't, I would be like a crazy street preacher holding a sign saying, you know, the taco apocalypse is coming, so try this taco truck really quick. <laughs> and so, when my wife told me that she was pregnant in 2003, I had already been doing this spiel for, for a while, and I realized, uh-oh, I know a couple things about feeding adults and pretty much nothing about feeding babies. So I did the involved hipster dad-to-be thing, and I went to the library, and I brought home a big stack of books. Yes, I, I am totally in love with the public library and just in awe of librarians. My wife is a librarian, too. <laughs> So I brought home this stack of books, all of which were more or less terrifying. Um, there were kind of three categories. There were the scary medical books about everything that can possibly go wrong uh, with feeding a young child. Important to have around if something goes wrong, but if you read one of these books from beginning to end, you will wonder how you survive to adulthood. <laughs> then there were the cute food books with lots of color pictures of like thinly sliced vegetables cut with cookie cutters into, into kitty faces and flower shapes. And, uh, you know, cute, but I didn't want to do this all the time, or like, you know, ever. <laughs> and, you know, these have actually gotten even worse recently in the form of bento box cookbooks, where now you have to make like 10 little dishes and arrange them in the form of a scene from a cartoon. And you, you have to do this for every one of your kids before school starts. And uh, I think this is what led to the modern women's movement. Um, <laughs> So then type three are the, the uh, baby, baby food puree books. And I figured that this is easy, um, this makes sense. So, and, and we did it a little bit. I did the, the pureed carrots and the ice cube tray thing. And we, uh, our, for Iris' first bite that wasn't a donut, we pureed an apricot from the farmer's market. And that was fine, but Iris wasn't really interested in that stuff. She was interested in stealing food off of our plates. Uh, and, uh, and so once we realized that, we're like, this is easy. And, and we let her. And uh, in her, in starting from when she was eight or nine months, um, she would eat uh, pod thai, she would eat spicy enchiladas, she would eat sushi, she would eat all the things that my wife and I like to eat, just uh, chopped up with a knife quick uh, to make them kind of baby formatted. And um, so I thought, I have discovered the secret of the universe here. Uh, that uh, thanks to my progressive approach to feeding children, I have, I have created an adventurous eater, and, and maybe I could even get a whole book out of this. And uh, when I let this idea slip to other parents, which, which I did as often as possible, they would give me the, the same kind of look that my mom gives me when, uh, when I make out that I know a thing or two about parenting. I, I have two younger brothers. We, it was not easy for my mother. And <laughs> so, I was genuinely surprised when Iris turned two and suddenly decided that she hated everything. And none, none of, <laughs> no, one, no one here is surprised, I know. Um, <laughs> because, you know, as Iris would say, duh, uh, kids get picky, sometime between, you know, 18 and 36 months. And I personally, I should have known this because I was pretty much the worst. Um, I don't think I tried a new food between age three and 11. Um, <laughs> I, I drove my parents insane. I, I know my mother is very proud of the fact that I'm a food writer now, but I also assume that every time she reads one of my articles, she says, Thai curry, I told that kid Thai curry was good 25 years ago. <laughs> and now he thinks he invented the stuff. <laughs> so when this does happen uh, to your kid, you end up in this kind of tragic existential situation. Because, I mean, for me, you know, there's nothing more fun for me as a parent or as a person than when I make something to eat and someone else plainly enjoys it. Um, and, so, and so I was having this experience all the time and then suddenly, boom, it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, props. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so you're in this situation where what was, you know, for me, absolutely the most fun part of parenting um, other than the water slide park. And, and it's gone. And it's like your kid is saying to you, I don't like the kind of food you like anymore. And that really hurts. 
And, and furthermore, um, you know, if you read uh, parenting magazines or watch TV, you, you have, there's this idea that there that you have to establish healthy eating habits early or uh, it will be too late and your kid will have to subsist on a diet of gummy worms and four loco for the rest of their lives or something. <laughs> um, and this is, this is a pernicious myth, I think. It's, uh, it's not true. Um, when, did, when did you guys learn to eat like an adult? For me, uh, it was when I went to college and there was no one looking over my shoulder to see what I was eating anymore. Um, and I think that's true for most people. Um, but so Iris was coming up to the dinner table and saying, uh, is that not spicy? Because I don't like spicy things. And, uh, and she would do things like uh, she, she asked, and when, I, and when I say ask, I mean uh, commanded me one night to, uh, to pick every grain of black pepper off of her chicken. <laughs> and, and I'm embarrassed to admit that, uh, that I complied. <laughs> so, so the question is, what should I do about this terrible, terrible situation that, uh, that I thought wasn't going to happen in my house? And, um, you know, I, I turned back to the books, and the, the least scary book about feeding kids, I think, is, uh, is Ellen Satter's book, Child of Mine, which I'm, I'm betting many people here have read. Um, and uh, it, uh, in the book, um, here's, here's what she says. She says, if you have even the most teensy-weensy of feeding agendas, I promise you won't have fun. A toddler can smell an agenda a mile away, and she will resist. <laughs> and it's really tempting as, an, as a parent to try and win food battles with your kids, because you're like, OK, I'm, I'm bigger, I'm stronger, uh, I have the power of reason, and I control the food supply. <laughs> and that kind of puts you in the same position as the politician who says, um, we've got some good ideas about democracy. We've got the biggest army in the world. I think we can probably win a war with that small Asian country. <laughs> when, it, when it gets on the ground, things get a lot more complicated. And so with, with help from Ellen Satter's book, what, what Iris and I came to as an agreement was what Ellen Satter calls the division of responsibility. And it goes like this. Uh, I decide what to cook and when to serve it. Iris decides whether to eat and how much to eat. Or, or to put it another way, um, once I put the food on the table, my job is done. Uh, I don't also have to make sure that every bite gets into her mouth. And that means that Iris can choose to eat only bread if I serve bread. It means she can choose to eat nothing if she's not hungry, which uh, happens a lot with two and three year olds when they're not growing very fast all of a sudden. And uh, she can't go into the kitchen and search for something I didn't serve. It doesn't mean that I'm just throwing up my hands and surrendering. Uh, and she can't uh, complain loudly about what I served unless I make something that really sucks, which happens sometimes. Um, and it sounds like a recipe for disaster. It sounds like, you know, there are so many things in early learning where if you took a hands-off approach, it would result in a far worse outcome. But this isn't one of them. Uh, I can't really say why that is, but experience has shown it to be true. And a, a common objection to this idea is, okay, maybe that works for you and your easy kid, and I admit I do have an easy kid, but it, it can't possibly work for my high-spirited child. Uh, you know, my child needs a swim coach. Uh, uh, she needs someone to, uh, to get in there and make sure that uh, she doesn't eat too much or too little and that she gets uh, a balanced uh, arrangement of bites into her mouth. Um, but what Ellen Satter shows in her book, um, I mean, she really demolishes that objection and shows that, in fact, the division of responsibility re approach is the most effective for the children who have the most serious feeding problems. Um, it's the only really effective way to get them back on a normal track. Um, the problem is, I mean, like, uh, like a passive investing strategy, implementing this is really brutally difficult because it means that you have to sit there when something terrifying is happening, uh, like uh, you're losing money and your kid isn't eating anything, and not freak out about it. And, uh, and furthermore, you know, you, you read about scary things all the time, like school lunches and childhood obesity and uh, the stock market and the debt ceiling. And the more you read that kind of thing, the more you think, God, I need to get in here and get active and fix this. And the reason not to do that is not because you don't care, but because you care enough to know that in this peculiar situation, any intervention you make is more likely to harm than to help. And I mean, one way I would put that is uh, maybe, maybe a good approach to, uh, to the feeding of children is uh, think globally, but don't act too locally. 
Um, you know, of course we should be involved in issues of childhood nutrition, but if we bring all of those issues to the table with us every night, then we're liable to ruin one of the greatest things about being a parent, which is sitting down and having a meal with your kids and uh, having food, at least maybe one thing that everybody at the table likes. And because uh, I really think that fun, you know, having fun at the table is, is the best indicator that you're doing things right. Uh, when you're feeding a young child. And that's, that's why Ellen Satter used the word fun uh, in the quote I read. And um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with that idea. Uh, and I'm sure that my uh, fun-loving, progressive approach to parenting will definitely prevent the day when Iris turns 12 and decides that she doesn't want to have dinner with us anymore because her parents are the worst parents in the history of the world. <laughs> That'll never happen. Right, everyone? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>